today I will talk about sea level indicators as proxy data for relative sea level change. So first, just a couple of uh, words about my project. Uh, so my work is part of the Palm Mode project, which is the big project fund funded by German uh, government. And uh, he, it aim of this project is to understand climate system dynamics and variability during the last glacial cycle. Uh, so simulation with earth system models will be done uh, to reconstruct the last glacial cycle. And the, my group contributes uh, with the solid earth part, with the solid earth deformation and sea level change due to the mass water uh, redistribution. And as you can see, it's a quite compre comprehensive project. It has 18 participating institutions. So to come to my talk, um, I started my introduction with answering to five W questions. And the uh, first one is why, why this has been done. So um, I don't know how much you, knows about, you know about sea level indicators, but uh, they're used as a main source for reconstructing relative sea level during the previous epochs when the satellite records are not available and the tide gauge data is not available. Uh, and they are used for validation of numerical models reconstructing a sea level in the, in the previous times. So what actually has been done here, uh, we are proposing a statistical model where the indicative meaning of the, of the uh, sea level indicator is transferred into the probability density function. And then we are fitting the prediction models to this, to this uh, uh, probability. So uh, the problem is that sea level indicators are not giving us a relative sea level, but only the indicative meaning. So that has to be solved. And uh, here we are proposing a, um, a model how to solve this. So just as a demonstration of this model, I chose uh, Hudson Bay, uh, which is the area near the former glaciation of with the center in uh, Canada, and um, because the indicators that I chose are located nicely around, around, around the bay. And uh, I chose for this, this, uh, this first demonstration of the model, I chose one type of the indicator, which is Mia Truncata shell. And um, it's the shell that it's uh, commonly uh, found in over the Arctic Sea and extends to the Bay of Biscay. And when? Well, the Holocene, so which is approximately 11,700 years before present, because this, this sea level indicator gives us that date. So this, this work is based on a COP article uh, called Probabilistic Assessment of Sea Level, and the Hibbert et al., where um, she also um, assumes the, the height distribution of the, of the indicators and not the normal distribution of the indicators. So the methodology I divided in five steps, uh, where first four steps are actually developing the, the statistical model. And then the, five step, the fifth step, which is in different color, is actually application of this model. So the first four steps are first to reconstruct the relative sea level from the sea level indicators, because I said that sea level indicators only give us indicative meaning. And then from there, to calculate the the uh, probability density function of the height, and then to uh, calibrate the ages, the C14 ages, to determine age probability density function. And then the final step of the model is to get the joint probability density function. And then, of course, the application is to fit uh, model predictions. So I will go into more into details in next steps. So first step, as I said, because uh, is to map the, me the indicative meaning of sea level indicators to, to relative sea level by using the, the modern depth distribution of this shell of, or this particular indicator that I'm using. And uh, this uh, modern day data I'm obtaining from, obtaining from the OBIS database. So how's that been done? Here, it's a, here you can see the layout of the Slivisu database that I'm using. So that's a database for sea level indicators which is uh, developed at, um, at, with, by my group in the GF set, and it contains more than 9,000 indicators. Uh, so it's a, it's a global uh, database. And from there, I'm, I'm choosing my, my indicators. Here you can see, I don't know how much is visible on the globe, um, the Hudson Bay, and the yellow points, yellow points are, are marking um, the Mia Truncata indicators. So here, you can choose here um, the area or the type of the indicator or whatever you want. 
So I'm picking my sea level indicators from this database and I'm getting the information about their, their um, height or depth in this case. And this is the OBIS database that I mentioned that I am getting my uh, modern day data. And um, yeah, just to mention that this is our DIC uh, compilation of indicators because there are different sources uh, in, this, uh, in this database. Uh, so yeah, okay, so, so with, with this uh, modern, uh, modern uh, distribution of the data, I'm transforming my, my um, indicator depth to get a relative sea level at that time when, when this uh, ind indicator is dated. And then I can continue with my second step where I'm calculating the height probability by doing the convolution of, the, of this projected height. And the convolution is because I have uh, a lot of records of the modern day data. And um, of course there's observational error uh, of each indicator and I'm including that to calculate my probability density function of height. And then I'm getting something like this. So this is uh, actually my, my indicator height with an error. Oh no, sorry, wrong. Here, this is my indicator height with observational error and this is the distribution of the modern day data. So this contains more values. And then I'm shifting my observed value by the height of this modern day data. And then I'm getting some um, convolution uh, of, the, of, of the height in, and calculating the probability density function. And it looks something like this. And then I'm proceeding to the step three, which is calibrating the radiocarbon dated material. Uh, considering the information from the sample metadata, what, that, that, the, what does that mean? It means that um, depending on the indicator environment, uh, uh, we are calibrating it with the OXCAL um, uh, calibration software and uh, where is it included if it's a marine curve or um, atmospheric curve, so based on the environment of the particular indicator. So again, I'm getting my information, uh, so some, some median calibration age from, from here, from Seviso database, which is actually here, this, this year here, that has also observational error. And then the um, OXCAL is giving me some kind of probability that, that's not normally distributed based on the curve I selected, so based on the environment uh, of the indicator. So here I'm getting my uh, probability density function of the age. So then the final step of developing the model is getting the joint probability of these two probabilities. So the, the output of my step two and my step three, um, and I'm putting them together in the joint probability, which looks something like, like this. So, so this is the, the second step, the high probability. Here I have the age probability, and then multiplying those two probabilities, I get a contour like this, which is a joint probability. Um, so probability of height distribution and age. And then, uh, going into the uh, application, uh, getting the conditional probability for a given model prediction, and I'm calculating that, that from this joint probability that I just got. So um, I'm using some numerical models that my, my group provide me. So those are GIA models uh, with different um, uh, ice sheet uh, models inside, and from there I'm getting the information um, of of the height and, and the slope, actually the change of the sea level uh, with time. Uh, and then I'm, I'm assuming it's a linear, in linear um, transformation just to the simplicity now in the beginning. And then I'm getting uh, this curve that I'm fitting into my, my uh, joint probability and getting uh, a likelihood. So I'm getting the value, I'm getting the fit actually of the model. So this is one example for one indicator at, at a certain time, at the, at the time when this indicator uh, was like C14 uh, dated. And here as example are uh, different models, so, uh, so a di different output. So it's the same model but with a different lower mantle viscosity, so uh, from one to four and you can see here the different fit of the models. So 
So this contour is presenting uh, one sigma error, two sigma error, and three sigma error. So the closest uh, to the center it is, to this one sigma, it's the better the fit of the model is. And here is just uh, to demonstrate how, how they vary with a different mantle uh, viscosity. And to summarize everything, uh, so here we propose a statistical uh, model where the indicative meaning of the sea level indicator and the uncertainty of the calibration is transformed into probability density function so that we can use this uh, to validate our prediction models. And uh, the next step will be to uh, aggregate the fit over, over the one area, so get all the samples in one area and to get the fit of the model for one type of the sample. And um, also to extend to different sample types because this was just developed for one type, so one just for shell and there are a variety of, of uh, sea level indicator like driftwood or bones or, or whatever. And, um, and then this will be used to, to validate um, the models with a different rheology structure uh, and, and of the earth crust and mantle. And just the last slide, so this is the upcoming conference or, of our project, so next year in Vienna, and I think more details will come soon. And thank you for your attention. For the, uh, the height, uh, do you use sort of uh, an assumption of where this uh, particular shell lived, certain depths, to make uh, a dis distribution for your height, or how do you do that? Yeah, th that, that's, that's the, what we are doing. So we have, the, not the assu assumption, but the modern day data is telling us where uh, this shell lives. Because now we know where the, the sea level is and we know where the shells are found. But in, with our record, we only have the depth based on the, 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 the modern uh, sea level. So that's why we're transforming this, actually. That's why we're using the information of the modern day data to get the, um, the previous relative sea level. What are your plans uh, for, you mentioned you're gonna group, uh, run, run your probability run through groups of samples. So what are your plans for smoothing that XY relationship? <laughs> Still no plans because <laughs> that's the next phase. I was struggling just to get this, this first one. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe to, to look more detail into the, the, the indicators because also they're not that precise and depending on the source. So that's, how, that's the way to exterminate some outliers that will give some, some errors, some larger errors. You mentioned bones. Are you using any terrestrial fossils? Like the occurrences of, um, I was thinking like the west coast of the US, of North Canada, where you do have caves that are right near sea level that have um, they, mixtures of seals, but also say bear bones in them. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I only saw whale bones, but I think that they're okay. probably other yeah we, we will the plan is to extend this method to the whole database okay and just now because it was the easiest to get the modern day data and to to validate model like this but th this is the next step to to uh, to get for every type of indicator you're modeling your height response as a linear function you said uh yeah uh, but um, uh, in canada or in the regions formerly glaciated the response is mostly exponential uh, but towards modern day, it can be more properly approximated as quadratic. So are you thinking about exploring a better fit to the exponential response that the Earth system is supposed to experience? In yes, positions? of course. <laughs> so as I said, this is just the developing of the model. So we are going with the easiest parameters. So that's why the linear transformation is considered right now. But for, for next, uh, expanding the model, exponential will be taken into consideration, definitely. I'm gonna talk about some of the work that I did when I was at UC Davis, um, looking at the Laurentide ice sheet and um, specifically the contribution of meltwater from that ice sheet, the contributions to sea level rise um, as expressed through drainage from the Mississippi River. And so during the melting of the Laurentide ice sheet, this is a, a several reconstructions over the last deglaciation of um, uh, moving through time over the last deglaciation of the Mississippi River drainage basin, and it's the top of the okay. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> and so and so here the margin of the Mississippi River drainage. This is based on different ice sheet models, but you can see that the the presence of the Laurentide ice sheet here that there was some meltwater coming down the Mississippi River, um, and the amount of that meltwater um, that entered the Mississippi or that that entered the ocean. Um, 
it depends on which ice sheet model you use here. And, um, and specifically, uh, looking at records from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this is both a, a compilation of data and also flow routed mixing models um, based on the oxygen isotope value of seawater <coughs> as reconstructed from uh, planktic foraminifera. And, um, and so the oxygen isotope value is based on some linear mixing with an end member um, that is either precipitation. Here you can see a, a couple of hypothesized mixing models from out here at a salinity of seawater salinity and projected out to um, oxygen isotope values for precipitation. It would be like minus 5, minus 15 that might be integrated over the entire Mississippi River drainage. Um, and here's a hypothesized um, mixing end member of minus 30 per mil that um, is inferred to be um, a, a value for Laurentide ice sheet meltwater. Um, and, and that's an average value for the Laurentide ice sheet. But we know, um, we know that modern ice sheets have a lot of oxygen isotope heterogeneity. And here's Antarctica, and th these are a bunch of measurements of snow and ice ranging from minus 10 to minus 55. Um, and then uh, this is a simulation of precipitation over North America. This is a view of the Arctic here. Um, but modeling, modeling the uh, isotope value of a former ice sheet is challenging. Here's only one existing um, ice sheet model of, um, of the oxygen isotope values. And so constraining this actual, uh, constraining this parameter here is dependent on knowing the, um, the oxygen isotope value of the meltwater as it entered the ocean. And then you can calculate the volumetric contribution. And so if we could constrain that, here um, and, and reconstruct a salinity to oxygen isotope uh, linear mixing model in the past during the melting of the ice sheet, then we could potentially uh, constrain these volumetric contributions. Um, here are some reconstructions of just the delta 18O value of calcite from planktic foraminifera, and this is a bulk record based on uh, multiple individual forams that are combined into single a single measurement, but if you look at, at individual foraminifera, um, the, the, this is from the same record, and each of these points here now is a single foram, um, and there's a, a range between individuals of more than four per mil in a single core interval, just within a single centimeter. Um, and so here we can actually use this breadth of variability of oxygen isotope values between foraminifera, uh, use that to our advantage to reconstruct um, to reconstruct what that mixing model might have been like. So I, I went to this record, which is from Carly Williams, published in 2012, um, and her record is from uh, G. Ruber in the black, and each of these points here with a star is where I sampled several, uh, several centimeters, and within each centimeter or half centimeter core interval, I analyzed uh, several up to 20 to 30 individual foraminifera of the species Orbulina universa, which has a, a really broad depth habitat range. And so uh, we'd try to use that to our advantage to capture a greater variability. And uh, I measured both the, the magnesium calcium and oxygen isotope value and also uh, used an independent parameter for salinity, which is um, calibrated the barium to salinity relationship calibrated here from the Mississippi River. So this is based on uh, over 300 measurements. This is at the mouth of the Mississippi River here, and it's distributary, the Atchafalaya, and all of these measurements um, were compiled into, um, I just put them here, all of these measurements are the blue and then the black are in, actually in the Mississippi River channel. And for comparison, I put the barium to salinity relationship for a couple of other rivers. Here's the Ganges and the Congo and the Amazon. Um, and so I used this relationship between salinity and barium and converted that to a relationship that we can then measure by uh, measuring the barium to calcium ratio in the foraminifera. And that's this, uh, this right here, which is a basin specific proxy to be able to reconstruct the salinity at the mouth of the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico. So here's some results. Each point is a single foram and the, the y-axis here is not linear. Each, each line here is a, um, 
is an individual one centimeter or half centimeter core interval. And so these are just the measured oxygen isotope values of single 4 -ams from early on in the deglaciation, proceeding through Heinrich Stadial uh, in those different stars, those different individual, um, individual spots. Here's moving into the bowling alarod and then a couple in the Younger Dryas and some Holocene or Quartop. Um, here's the measured magnesium calcium ratios. Again, each point is a single 4 -am, um, and I'll, I'll show you these plotted together later. Um, and then here's the, the reconstructed delta 18O value of seawater using the, the temperature component from magnesium calcium and the measured oxygen isotope value here. Um, and I just want to point out that, that the range of delta 18O of seawater is really, really narrow in both the Holocene and also uh, in these intervals from the Younger Dryas. And it's a really big range here, which is desirable um, for uh, for earlier on during the deglaciation when there was ice sheet meltwater uh, entering the Gulf of Mexico. Here are the measured barium to calcium results. Um, again, a really narrow range in the Holocene and again in the Younger Dryas and really broad ranges here right in the heart of the deglaciation um, when there was a range of salinity conditions. And, um, and then this is just uh, salinity plotted up with temperature or barium calcium to magnesium calcium. Um, and the red and the black here are the Holocene. Um, they have a, a similar overlap in temperature, um, but a really broad range of salinity going back, um, going back into the deglaciation. And so what I want to do now is take you through a couple of examples of different time slices here um, of these individual. Um, so we're, I'm going to show you just a couple examples of like a one centimeter core interval looking at the oxygen isotope value of seawater reconstructed plotted against the oxygen or plotted against reconstructed salinity um, in order to hopefully be able to generate a, a regression relationship like this to be able to then come back and calculate the oxygen isotope value of the y-intercept when salinity is zero, and that would be the oxygen isotope value of glacial meltwater. Here's an example from early on in the deglaciation. This is actually from this point right here, this star and this star. So early on in the record, about 17 and a half thousand years ago, and um, it's disappointing to start with this one because it doesn't really show a relationship at all, um, and there's the, there's no uh, there's no relationship that that shows clear mixing with glacial meltwater. There is enhanced barium um, that's not diagenetic. That, so there's enhanced barium in um, the Gulf of Mexico and that, that shows that there's some level of meltwater um, and, and potentially, uh, there's certainly Mississippi River water entering the Gulf of Mexico. Um, whether or not that is uh, mixing with glacial meltwater, it's difficult to say. Um, so there's still a riverine influence, and if there is glacial meltwater, it probably had an oxygen isotope value that's really close to that of regional precipitation. So it's, it's not it's it's not able to be resolved whether that's river influence or not. Here's some much better examples. Um, so here in the middle of Heinrich Stadial One, <laughs> um, here's a, an open ocean value to um, to constrain that. This is out here at a projected salinity of 37 or 38 psu for the Gulf of Mexico during that time, during the deglaciation. Um, and here's, the, here's a regression relationship um, that goes through all these points. The, the green is just through the, the data, and then the black also includes that open ocean value. And the y-intercept here is the oxygen isotope value of that end member fresh water. Here it's minus 18 in this example. Here it's minus 20, and these are examples from, uh, from these two different spots. Um, and this is... This is pretty much what we would expect from the southern margin of the Laurentide ice sheet uh, in terms of oxygen isotope values. Here's an example from a little bit further on during the deglaciation into the bowling alarod. Um, and so values range from, here's an example with minus 20 per mil uh, for a y-intercept or the, the freshwater end member. And here's an example with minus 34, some of the reconstructed values uh, vary up to minus 49 per mil, which is which is really really negative, but that's not unreasonable given a Laurentide ice sheet with a um, a height of about three kilometers, um, and this means that the meltwater was potentially coming from uh, from deep in the interior of the ice sheet and being um, and moving out 
and going down the, the southern drainage route. Um, I just want to show you really quickly, here's the Younger Dryas in red and the Holocene in black. This is the, the modern Delta 18O of seawater range um, from the Caribbean or from the Gulf of Mexico. And so we can reconstruct the Delta 18O value of seawater spot on from these individual foraminifera. Um, and then this is the predicted barium to calcium value that we would expect in a shell uh, based on what the open ocean barium is. And so there's no evidence of, of any meltwater, or even any riverine influence. Um, and, and this is likely um, because during the Younger Dryas, the paleo shoreline uh, had risen um, and had retreated backwards. And so the, the site of the Orca Basin, where this core comes from, was no longer uh, subject to, um, to Mississippi River influence, whether or not there was meltwater. Um, and so here's, th this is just a summary slide. Um, again, this is a, a, a record based on G. Ruber um, from Carly Williams, and then I sampled all these spots. And here, early on in the deglaciation, uh, the delta 18 value of Laurentide ice sheet meltwater, if it was introduced into the Mississippi River, is probably not distinguishable from regional precipitation. Um, and similarly, uh, Mississippi River outflow later on in the deglaciation in the Younger Dryas was not recorded in this core. But here, uh, during the heart of the deglaciation, we start with uh, more positive values, minus 10, minus 20, and then you can see the, this right here is Meltwater Pulse 1A, that gray bar, and you can see a progression of uh, progressively more negative values as, uh, as the ice sheet was systematically mined for meltwater during its melting and during its collapse. Um, and that's it, thank you. I guess I was wondering, because I guess you'd expect some change in the isotopic composition of your regional precipitation over the deglaciation, and w perhaps would that not bias your calculation of the uh, your, your ice sheet source composition? So yeah. Could, I mean, can you constrain that? Could you have competing influences? And um, so the, the answer is yes, you would expect some change in the isotopic composition of regional precipitation. Um, that integrated value for regional precipitation is across uh, at least at least 20 degrees latitude um, and across a, a huge longitudinal path. And so the integrated, the, the actual isotopic value of Mississippi River water, since it, it drains mo most of North America, doesn't change that much uh, as, as measured at the outlet, although it does change across different, um, different parts of the drainage basin. And so the um, introducing glacial meltwater as an end member is so dramatically different. And also during, uh, during times when that meltwater was coming down the Mississippi River, it overwhelmingly dominated it volumetrically. And so it dominated the isotopic signal as well. Just to follow up on the last question, do you think there's a way to calculate from your results the volume of meltwater that was entering the Gulf of Mexico? Yes, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Heather Burbitt. I'm a PhD student actually working with Anders Carlson here at Oregon State University. And I'm going to be switching your focus over to the Cordillera ice sheet. All right, so first, uh, why, why are we interested in the Cordillera? And, you know, there are several reasons, but in and of itself, the Cordillera is a pretty interesting ice sheet. It, at the last glacial maximum, it was a marine terminating ice sheet, and it is a temperate ice sheet fueled by this high precipitation gradient that we have um, specifically here in Southeast Alaska. This is one of the largest precipitation grad modern precipitation gradients in the world. And we also have this uh, warm Alaskan current that travels along the, the western margin of the ice sheet here, which makes it a highly sensitive ice sheet to changes in sea surface temperature and sea, sea level. Another reason we're interested in the Cordilleran is that it might also be an analog for modern Southeast Greenland. So in Southeast Greenland, we have similar features. We have high elevation here, we have high precipitation off that same coast range, and then we have the warm Imager current coming through here. So there might be a way that we can learn more about the Cordilleran through its past history and what that might tell us in, in terms of the, the Greenland ice sheet. So if we take a look back at the longer paleoclimate of the region, this is a, a table or a, a plot from Praetorius and Mix 2014 comparing the Gulf of Alaska Delta 18 record in this pink here with the black uh, end grip data from Greenland. 
And this, this figure is, is meant to be comparing the, the phase relationships between the two where we see that there are parts where they are out of phase and parts where they are strongly in phase. But the important thing here is looking at the Cordilleran record, we have this slow, this gradual warming prior to the bowling and then a very abrupt bowling warming at, at the, that uh, time right there. And we don't necessarily see that in the Greenland ice sheet or in the Greenland record. So we want to understand a little bit more about maybe what the ice behavior was during this, this uh, temperature change here. So again, because this is a marine terminating ice sheet, that means a lot of the sediment that is generated by these glaciers is being deposited as marine sediments off the, off the continental shelf. And as a result, we can actually study the history of this ice sheet by looking at these ice proximal marine sediment cores. So this is what we chose to do. Um, here is a, a map with the last glacial maximum outlined in white right here along the coast, showing uh, the Cordilleran ice sheet here, the Laurentide goes off the screen over there, and then this goes from Alaska all the way down to Washington State down here. So the two cores that we're choosing to focus on are this 85JC core off of Southeast Alaska and this MDO2-2496 core off of Vancouver Island. Looking at these cores, um, you know, we're able to tell a couple different things, but, but initially the, there's been a lot of data done on, or a lot of work done on this, these cores already, including uh, very high resolution sea surface temperature records. On the 85JC core, this was done by Davies et al. And on the MDO2 core, this is Cosman Hendy and Hendy 2009, uh, and, and Taylor et al. 2014. So in, in the 85JC, we have an, an alkanone based sea surface temperature as well as delta O18 from forums, and in the MDO2, we have magnesium calcium for this, the sea surface temperature, as well as delta 18. Age models for these cores were constructed by Davies Walzak 2014 for the 85JC and Cosmet et al. 2008. And the important thing here is that you see that these are extremely well dated cores. So we have a, a very nice constraint on timing of, of the signals that we see when we're looking at the, the sediments in these cores. This also means that when we're doing comparisons of sea surface temperature, we actually have a, a really nice model for that as well, and we can do direct comparisons of sea surface temperature, age, and geochemistry, which is what we'll be looking at. So this idea is that, or this, this project is based on the idea that as the ice sheets chew through the bedrock of, of the region, they are essentially sampling the geochemistry of those, those geologic units, and as a result, they are leaving behind a geochemical signal in the marine sediment cores. So how, how can we use those cores to our advantage? Again, this map, we're just going to focus in right here and right here. But I'm going to point out, when looking at this LGM extent here, you can see any ice moving around this area is going to be going back and forth across these mountains here. And down here on the southern Cordilleran ice sheet, any ice around here will be moving across these different units down here. And when we zoom in and look at the geology for these regions, we see that we have different types of geology in southeast Alaska. We happen to be separated by a thrust fault here. And then in, uh, off of Vancouver Island, which is this shape right here, we have three different units that we're, that we're using to study the geochemistry here. So what does this mean in terms of the geochemistry, looking at this, the bedrock? In the Northwest Cordilleran, so off of Southeast Alaska here, we have Mesozoic crystalline basements, so granites, granitoids, separated from accreted marine sedimentary units by this uh, St. Elias, St. Elias uh, thrust fault. And the way that we're interpreting the, the geochemistry of this area is that uh, calcium is going to be representing these accreted marine sedimentary units, and potassium is going to be representing the, the crystalline basement up here. And the idea is that as we see ice move across this boundary, we should see a shift in the relative proportions. And we also model calcium against strontium to make sure that we're, we're taking in, into consideration any biogenic uh, signals as well. In the Southwest Cordilleran, it's a little bit of a different setting. We have the Cordilleran ice sheet coming here as well as the Puget lobe and the Juan de Fuca lobe would have occupied these areas. And instead of being separated by a thrust fault, what we expect to see is, is calcium again for those accreted marine sedimentary rocks, which is what we have on the Olympic Peninsula. And then iron for these basalts on the southern part of Vancouver Island. And potassium for granitoids that are kind of mixed in throughout the, the various terrains that make up uh, Vancouver Island. 
So in order to study the, the geochemistry of these cores, what we do is we scan them using this core scanning XRF that we have at, at Oregon State University. And the idea is that we can, we can constrain the signal that this ice sheet is leaving behind by looking at these, these various, uh, the various composition of the geology in the core. And as I said before, this means with the well-dated course, uh, age model for these cores, we can actually do a direct comparison of these, the geochemistry of these cores with things like sea surface temperature. So some of the results that we have so far uh, for the northwestern Cordilleran off of southeast Alaska, there are a couple major things that we've been, that we've been looking at. The first one here is this, this peak that we see that we're taking as the deglacial signal. And you can see that in, in the calcium-potassium ratio, it spikes up and then drops back off. And in the calcium-strontium, we see a similar peak where it spikes up and drops back off. And this is all happening before this dashed black line here, which is the bowling, uh, bowling alarid. So the way that we're interpreting this is that we, we have ice retreating as, as we see these sea surface, sea surface temperatures warming. And this, this spike is actually from the, the ice retreating over the marine sedimentary units accreted on the, on the coast there. So you're seeing an increase in calcium proportionate to the potassium. And then as soon as we, the ice moves past that, that unit over that fault, we see a drastic drop in the calcium and the potassium is, is relatively, uh, relatively higher. The other interesting thing that we see with this, this peak is that it actually happens right when we see this three to four degree temperature change in the sea surface temperature. And when you, when you draw our, our little box that we have here kind of modeling where we see this, this first rapid response, we notice that there's kind of an, an eight degree Celsius threshold that, that maybe suggests that the ice sheet there isn't necessarily stable once you get above that temperature. And, and you'll see when we look at the next core, we see a similar pattern there. Um, one last thing to, to point out here is that, again, we see a, a peak in, in these two signals around the time of the Younger Dryas. And this we interpret, once again, as, as the ice maybe advancing onto that uh, calcium-dominated marine sediments and then retreating back off. So if I switch over to the geologic map one more time, this is showing you at the last glacial maximum, the ice would have been somewhere out on the continental shelf here. And we would see a diluted signal that is combining all three of these. But as the ice retreats during that warming, this signal out here, the, the continental shelf signal, disappears. And the calcium signal that we have here is what dominates. And that's that peak that we see in the geochemistry. And as the, the ice continues to retreat beyond this fault, we see that the, cal or the potassium is, is the, the lone geochemical signal that we see at that point. So like I said, if, if we look at the Southwest Cordillera, and we actually see somewhat of a similar signal just looking at slightly different geochemistry. So in this case, instead of a, a peak, because we're not seeing the ice change through different types of, of rock units as it erodes, we actually see a, a drastic decrease in these signals. So again, this top one here is the iron, representing basalt on Vancouver Island, potassium here representing the, the granitoids of Vancouver Island, and then calcium down here on the Olympic Peninsula. And the way you can interpret this, this drastic drop in in, uh, in this geochemical signal right again, right before the bowling alarud is, is that the ice is retreating off of these units and we see that signal disappear. And so once again, drawing in a, a box looking at where we see, um, so the green here is, is shading in where we see that deglacial signal, you, you can see again, we have a three to four degree temperature change and it seems to be that again, above, somewhere above that eight degrees C is, is no longer stable for these ice sheets. And then looking at the Younger Dryas for this region, we don't actually really see much of a signal in the, in the south, southwestern Cordilleran, and that might be a, re a regional signal rather than, than anything else, or it may have something to do with the larger glacial system, which is not something we have looked into at this point. So just again for the map to show you, you would have had the Puget <coughs> lobe occupying this basin here, the Juan de Fuca lobe coming out here, and various aspects of, of glacial occupation on Vancouver Island. And as this ice retreats, you see these signals drop off as the ice moves back off of the margin here. So in summary, we're, we're seeing a couple of really important things. And, and the things, the, the main important thing that, we're, that we've noticed with here, with the, with, the south, or with the western margin of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, is that we see deglaciation happening before the bowling interstadial hits this region. So even though we see those changes in, 
in sea surface temperature and, and you look at a global, global temperature record and we see that change, what happens for the northwestern and the southwestern margin of this ice sheet is that the ice begins retreating possibly up to several hundred years before the onset of the bowling. The other thing that's interesting is that this, this appears to be a concurrent retreat on both the northern and the southern margins of this ice sheet. And like we, we pointed out in the data, we, we think that this is, seems to be tied to this three to four degree rapid temperature change in, in the sea surface temperatures and possibly does show this, this ice sheet stability threshold at that eight degrees uh, C, C, sea surface temperature. And, and this is, you know, this is interesting for, for understanding the Cordilleran ice sheet, which is notoriously, at least on the western margin, difficult to study as it is. Um, it's a very wild country, difficult to access, and these marine sediment cores allow us to have this continuous record to look back at, at the deglacial signal here. But it might also be interesting to see if, if this is a pattern that, that we might see in the future, maybe in southeast Greenland as well. And it's something worth considering, you know, better, better understanding of a similar system where we do have this deglacial record, how it might be applied uh, to studies on southeast Greenland today. And with that, I will take any questions. Um, maybe I missed this part, but actually, did you sample the, the actual rocks also? Yeah, so that is actually that's something that we're in the process of doing right now. We have some samples from southeast Alaska that we collected last summer, and then this summer we'll go to Vancouver Island and collect so similar provenance, uh, provenance and members basically, to constrain the geochemistry. So it's in process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Question back there. Far to the. Really nice talk. Uh, to what extent do you think your southwest core is influenced by and, and actually receives a geochemical signal from uh, meltwater coming out the Strait of Juan de Fuca as opposed to just draining straight off of Vancouver Island? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely possible and we actually do expect that. That's, that's part of why we have the Olympic Peninsula in there as well, the accreted uh, marine sedimentary units. Um, we expect that as ice retreats around the, the Puget Lobe and the Juan de Fuca Lobe that you would see that signal disappear and then maybe you'd be looking at the, the iron and the potassium as a separate signal coming from glaciers that are specifically on Vancouver Island as opposed to further south. Now presumably when, when the ice is, uh, when the Juan de Fuca Lobe is still present, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you're probably also getting some, if you will, backside drainage coming down the Fraser Valley and splitting around the Olympic Peninsula and coming out the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, which just adds more complication, but it would be yet another signal that disappeared once the Strait, uh, the Juan de Fuca lobe disappeared itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, maybe that's something that looking into the, the specific geology of that very, very complex area would, would be an important thing to do in, in terms of seeing what other signals you might expect to see as the Juan de Fuca does open up the Strait there. Um, but I, my instinct would say that it, until then, we're at least just looking at the relative proportions of these, of these signals, and maybe that would be enough to give us that signal. And, and if not, it would be worth looking into the more complex geology. Great, thank you. One more question? Right, right, right in front. There you go. Hi, can I uh, cheekily get in two quick questions which are related? <laughs> uh, I wonder uh, what the role of your reconstruction uncertainties in both the X and Y play in your threshold values and uh, also, if your geochem signals are a result of the ice sheets retreating over different bedrock and you're saying at that time you have a temperature of, of X, 8 degrees, and you're suggesting that at that point the ice sheet's unstable, might it not be the case that the thresholds are a little bit lower because they're already retreating and maybe there, there's already some instability evident? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to to confirm, your your first question was about the uncertainty in the in the temperature threshold. Yeah, like the uh, your sea surface temperature reconstructions. Got Sorry. Yeah, so so the yeah. sea surface temperature records there were were done by past work on the on the uh, on the cores, and and you can absolutely look them up. Um, in terms of our our idea of this this temperature change and this temperature threshold, the uncertainties are that are really just us looking first pass at this data and where we see this correlation within these individual cores. Um, so we don't necessarily have a, a quantitative uh, uncertainty on those numbers at the moment. And then your, your second question was whether or not that threshold may in fact be lower than eight degrees. And, and that's very likely. Um, 
the way we were looking at it was 8C might be that, that number that we, we see in both records as, as being where that, that change is, is very obvious, but it, it very well could be younger or uh, lower than that because you would expect to see the ice retreating before you hit that margin, or you, you would expect to see that retreat before you hit that, that threshold. I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, through this work, I've relied on a lot of the expertise, data, and advice from many people. Uh, and I want to sp especially thank Crystal Buzert and Galen Sinclair at Oregon State University. Some of their data I'll be showing later in this presentation in comparison with what we're doing. But of course, all of the shortcomings in the talk are fully my own. Uh, the motivation for this work comes from the proliferation of beryllium-10 data that have recently been published around the Greenland ice sheet, which constrained the evolution of the ice sheet from the last glacial maximum to its present-day margin. And there was a study last year that argued the beryllium-10 data show a diachronous retreat around Greenland that uh, during the last deglaciation retreat started in the east and progressed to the south and the west. And that's not something we had seen in models before, and so we wanted to set out to understand more about the sensitivity of Greenland to different types of forcing and how that changed throughout the last deglaciation. So what I'm going to be talking about today are uh, attempts to look into a few different characteristics of the last glacial maximum to present day evolution of Greenland, including its sensitivity to ocean forcing, atmospheric forcing, and our choice of modeling just Greenland, or also including a connection with the Laurentide ice sheet. Just a bit about the model, I'm using the ice sheet model developed by Dave Pollard and Rob DeCanto, uh, sometimes called the Penn State ice sheet model, but it doesn't have a nice fancy acronym yet. Um, it's a hybrid ice sheet model, shallow ice, shallow shelf, uh, Thermo 3D thermodynamic ice sheet model that is used for sort of continental scale paleo runs. We use a positive degree day scheme for calculating surface mass balance and get basal sliding coefficients by inversion to modern geometry. And then we have ocean melt rates being calculated by a parameterization based on Martin et al, uh, where the ocean melt rates are proportional to the square of ambient <coughs> ocean temperatures minus the freezing point at the depth of the grounding line. Uh, we also are using a regional climate modeling approach to understand the sensitivity of the ice sheet to various choices about atmospheric forcing. And our approach to regional climate modeling is to run the Genesis global climate model, uh, and then once that's come to equilibrium, output six hourly forcing files around the Greenland domain and calculate a regional climate uh, at 40 kilometer resolution. We recouple to the ice model every 1,000 years using boundary conditions, SSTs and sea ice from a long integration of the CESM model uh, published by Lou et al., atmospheric gases from ice cores, orbits, and then ice 6G for northern hemisphere ice sheets outside of Greenland from uh, Peltier et al. For the present day, you can see that we uh, do a reasonably good job with the regional climate model of simulating the known characteristics of Greenland climate. Here is RACMO 2.1 for comparison, another regional climate model. The, some slight differences are that it's generally colder in our reconstruction in central Greenland and also wetter in general, but we do capture the high precipitation along the southeast coast and higher precipitation along the west coast in comparison to the a very arid northeast Greenland for the modern day ice sheet. The uh, benefit of this approach is it allows us to go back in time and look at how the climate has changed under different uh, boundary condition scenarios. And so here I'm showing uh, results from the regional climate model for different time slices during the deglaciation. In this first column, we have the predicted uh, regional climate model output. In the second column is the regional climate model output for 1,000 years ago, which is just the final coupling step we have with the Greenland ice sheet. And then in the third column is the difference. And finally, I've lapse rate corrected the difference to the modern day ice surface geometry so that we can compare with the ice core reconstructions. Uh, in the first row here, we have the Holocene thermal maximum, which occurs in our regional climate modeling at around 6,000 years ago. You can see much warmer temperatures compared to present day, especially in central Greenland. In the lower two uh, rows, we have the Younger Dryas and the Bowling Alarod. Uh, there's not a strong difference between these two. We're generally still in the cold glacial climate, and our regional climate modeling lacks a mechanism for producing both the bowling alarod warming and the younger dryas cooling, and that's why we don't see those things. In comparison to the reconstructions, so here these reconstructions are from Christo Ruzert uh, using the modern day fields of Jason Box and then scaled back in time and space using 
Delta 15N reconstructions from three ice cores in Greenland. Uh, and so it's the same thing. You have modern day and different time slices in the past, and then the difference for comparison between what the ice core based reconstructions look like for climate and what our RCM reconstructions look like for climate. You can see a stronger latitudinal gradient in the ice core based reconstructions, as well as a colder Younger Dryas relative to the Bulling Alarod uh, and the spatial differences between these two fields. But we're interested now in looking at the full deglaciation and how the ice sheet evolves when we apply these different forcings. Um, in terms of the temporal evolution of these different uh, climate scenarios, you can see in the top part of this graph reconstructions for four different sites along Greenland, which I've uh, taken at the same temporal resolution as we've run the climate model, so every 1,000 years. And in this lower panel, you have the regional climate model. Um, for the reconstructions, you can see that all of the areas follow the same spatial pattern, the same temporal pattern, more or less. That's how the reconstructions have been defined. But when we use the regional climate model, we see slight differences, especially between inland sites and coastal sites. So at coastal sites, we have about twice the magnitude of uh, glacial to modern day temperature change as we do in inland sites. We also see an earlier Holocene warming along the coast relative to the inland sites and a more pronounced Holocene thermal maximum at the inland <coughs> sites occurring around six to 5,000 years ago. Uh, now I want to look at the implications of these results for the last glacial maximum ice sheet and the deglaciation. So here are two uh, different ice sheets that we've reconstructed compared to the modern day ice sheet that you can see here. This is for the last glacial maximum ice sheet when we allow ocean temperatures to cool by five degrees. You can see that the ice advances out onto the continental shelf in southeast and northeast Greenland and as well as in west Greenland where we have large ice shelves developing. If we also extend our domain to include an Inuition ice sheet, we have a lot of uh, buttressing across Nair Strait and the development of a large ice shelf within Baffin Bay that's grounded along the continental shelf break. Uh, however, you don't see the same advance of the grounding line in southeast or northeast Greenland, uh, which is more driven by the ocean temperature change. Um, I made the cardinal sin of trying to show a movie in a talk at a place I've never given a talk before. So if you would like to see some fun movies of the deglaciation, come talk to me later. It just means we have to have more face time. Um, but it's okay. The important part of the slide is over here. Now what we're trying to do is look at the last 22,000 years and determine the different factors that lead to the ablation of the ice sheet during this period. In the topmost panel, I've divided the ablation into its three major components, the fraction due to surface melt in red, the fraction due to ocean warming in purple, and the fraction driven by calving in light blue. Below that, in this shaded curve, you can see the change in mass balance of one of our simulations going from 20,000 years to present. So when it's blue, the ice sheet is gaining mass, and when it's in red and black, the ice sheet is losing mass, and the units are in gigatons per year on the right-hand axis. Um, finally, I show the total ice volumes for the various uh, experiments that I'm discussing today. You can see that the blue and purple, which just differ in terms of their ocean forcing, the differences in those really only occur during the glacial period, and the evolution through the deglaciation is very similar. Uh, so uh, in the next slides, I'll only be showing one of these. The regional climate model-driven simulations show a much uh, larger and stable ice sheet up until about 10,000 years ago, and then a more rapid uh, decrease. Um, and this is driven by those differences in the inland and coastal sites. So we can still have deglaciation earlier in places where the coastal sites are warming first. And then for the full domain, the uh, ice sheet with the Inuition component reaches a, a much larger full ice volume. But if we just consider the part around Greenland, it's about 14 meters of sea level equivalent. Um, finally, I just want to take you on a little tour around Greenland where we've tried not just to look at the sensitivity of the ice sheet to these different components through time, but also in space. So I've broken up the ice sheet into 14 different regions based on Sinclair et al. 2016, where beryllium-10 data exists to constrain the timing of deglaciation around the margin. I'm showing the data of, based on beryllium-10 in the background histograms, which are colored in. And then we have three different simulations, one based on an ice core climate, one using this larger Inuition ice sheet, which buttresses across the Nair Strait, and one using the regional climate model atmospheric forcing in the non-filled in histograms on these plots. And I've defined these histograms based on the mean and standard deviation of the deglaciation times within our model. Lastly, I show in the pie charts the same three components, but broken up 
by these different regions. So red being surface mass balance, uh, surface melt, purple being ocean melt, and blue being calving. So we can see in the north, uh, especially in the northeast, surface melt is driving the majority of ice loss leading up to the deglaciation. And we have a delay in deglaciation when we use this larger inuition ice sheet of about 4,000 years, and the same with the regional climate model. As we progress further down the east coast, we see that ocean melt and calving, these oceanic components of the mass balance, are playing a larger role in driving mass loss leading up to the deglaciation. And as we can con continue down the coast, we see the same thing, these oceanic components playing a larger role than uh, in the north. We have some trouble in the East Greenland because the fjords are so narrow, getting the ice to deglaciate and not readvance during the uh, Holocene, but we're working on that, and if you're interested, come talk to me after. Um, again, we see that the inuition, inclusion of the Inuition ice sheet in Southeast Greenland delays deglaciation, but only by about 2,000 years, less as uh, we saw compared to the North. If we continue around to the west and southwest of Greenland, so we're just going sort of clockwise, we see that in southwest, uh, ocean melting and calving components again play a large role in determining the mass balance. But as we progress further west, surface melt starts to drive the deglacial mass loss. And we also have a better match to the beryllium-10 data when we include the Inuition ice sheet or use the regional climate model. And finally, we'll continue up the last part of the west coast. And you can see that surface melt continues to dominate uh, the mass loss leading up to the deglaciation in these regions. I just want to step out so we can look at everything all at once and show you that we have the majority of mass loss leading up to the deglaciation coming from surface melt in northeast and along the west coast of Greenland, and then ocean components playing a larger role when we look along the east coast and in the south. Um, we also do not find this sort of north, east, south, west progression of deglaciation around Greenland when we use our uh, model. That's not something we see. We see deglaciation occurring uh, more at the same time in these different regions when we just take a broad brush approach. If we go to the simulation where we've used the Inuition ice sheet, you'll see that the de delayed deglaciation in north and east Greenland results in a better match to the beryllium-10 data. Um, and in south and west Greenland, it's less clear uh, that that is having an effect in uh, one direction or another. Finally, when we look at the regional climate modeling results, I should also say, although ocean components in general drive more of the melting in these simulations because the ice advances more into the ocean, we see the same pattern that the east and the southwest are more susceptible to the ocean components whereas the west and the north are more susceptible to surface melting. Um, finally, if we go to the regional climate model, the largest change is that we see the southwest mass loss being driven mostly by surface melting and uh, ocean components still dominating in the southeast, um, but more heterogeneity in West Greenland where we see uh, surface melt dominating in a few places and ocean components dominating in others. So that's something that we're looking further into and exploring marginal records of climate change uh, that may differ from what we see in the ice cores. Um, so I'll just say that these choices for how we set up the ice sheet, they have an impact on when the ice sheet deglaciates and the uh, sensitivity of various regions to different mass balance components. But in general, we find that in East Greenland and South Greenland, the ice sheet is very vulnerable to ocean warming and ocean mass loss components, whereas along the west and north of Greenland, surface melt is dominating mass loss during the deglaciation. Uh, and we are exploring uh, also regional climate modeling as another approach for understanding how marginal climate changes may differ from interior climate changes during the deglaciation. And we find that in north and west Greenland, having an expanded domain, including the Inuition ice sheet, gives us a better match with beryllium-10 data. In south and east Greenland, uh, that's not the case, and that may be because we are uh, having, it may be related to our spin-up. So there's some really interesting data coming out of uh, North Greenland that is making me think more about these results. Uh, I just want to say thank you for NSF and Pages for funding and take any questions. Thanks. What temperature of the ocean are you taking for present day? Yeah, the present day is coming from the World Ocean Atlas 2009. Okay, and, and, the, and the timing of, of the warming of the ocean and the atmosphere is the same? Yeah, it's, uh, we base the 
adjustments to ocean temperature on a record from the Labrador Sea from Kelsey Windsor 2012. Um, uh, something that we would like to do is look into spatial uh, heterogeneity in ocean temperature change throughout this period, but uh, yeah, we have not done that yet, uh, sort of because there's a lack of records in many places to constrain how that changed. But in the ocean forcing, the uh, peak in ocean temperatures is at 12,000 years ago, and it's about uh, two and a half degrees above modern. Okay, and, and finally another one. Uh, maybe I didn't understand, but the, the simulation with the Inusian ice Yes. Uh, the, the ice sheet grounds at, at Baffin Bay or it doesn't ground? It, it does not ground inside Baffin Bay. It grounds at the shelf break and then there's okay. a large, uh, at the continental shelf break and there's a large ice shelf that develops and covers Baffin Bay. Okay. Thank First, thanks Ben, that was awesome. I think I'm gonna maybe be someone who presents some data that makes all the ice modelists think a little bit. So my name is Anna, I'm a grad student at Oregon State. I'm co-advised by Anders Carlson and I'm gonna talk about my reconstructions of relative sea level in northern Greenland from uh, marine biovolves on what that might mean for our ice history interpretations and GIA models. And so what do we really care about? Is it actually sea level? No, it's not sea level. It's uh, the history of northern Greenland, I would like to say, because we know that the global sea level that's stored in, in northern Greenland can be up to six meters. And if we want to get our future projections of sea level right, we need to incorporate accurate predictions of the melt behavior of northern Greenland or like Greenland in general. And um, in order to do that, we can look at the paleo record that extends much further back than our instrumental record, which is kind of such like as the, the grace record that goes back to 2003. But the paleo record might give us an actual understanding of what are the, what's the melt behavior of the Greenland ice sheet? What parameters do we need to get right in the models? And where might we find thresholds that might lead to nonlinear responses? So what do we need to know to reconstruct an ice sheet history? We need two things, right? We need the ice extent, which can be done by looking at the morphology, um, like moraines, which Sinclair and Al have done in 2016. And the second thing you need to know is the ice mass in the past, which is a little bit harder to get it because there's no visual evidence for that. What we use here is um, the response of the land to isostatic forcing. So if you think about sea level as our fixed reference frame, as soon as you put an ice sheet on the land, it will compress your land into the mantle and it will appear as if sea level is going up. Again, if you take that ice sheet away, your crust will rebound and it will look like relative sea level is falling. So for all of you who are thinking in terms of eustatic sea level response, kind of just make sure you compartmentalize that a little bit right now because normally you think that during the last glacial sea level goes down because the ice is stored in the, in, on like ice sheets. But I'm looking at the near field data. So in my talk, what you will see is that the more ice we have, the higher sea level will be, which is a little bit counterintuitive if you're not thinking about that the right way. So a lot of ice means high sea levels and vice versa. This data has like the, the same thing that I've been done has been done before. It's um, a very, very common way to reconstruct sea level. And um, there have been a lot of interpretation in exactly the region that I've been working on. I've been looking at Northern Greenland, the area adjacent to Narrow Strait. There's a right there. Right here. Top button, the top button. Top button. There you go, yeah. So I've been looking at Northern Greenland, the areas adjacent to Narrow Strait. And that has been reconstructed by England in 1985. Is that me too? Highlights? <laughs> 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 um, and Previously, there have been two quite different interpretations that have been done in this region. So the early interpretation was that there was an ice-free corridor between Ellesmere Island and Northwest Greenland during the last glacial. That, so ice near Strait wasn't covered in ice. And later on, in England actually changed its mind about that in 1999. The common interpretation is that the Inuitian ice sheet and Northern, on Greenland coalesced in near Strait, and this area was covered in ice uh, during MIS 2 and 3. And uh, just to give my conclusion away, maybe both are right at the same time, and that makes the whole problem a little bit more complicated. So I've been reconstructing relative sea level using marine bivalves that we have been collecting in, as part of the Peterman project in 2015 on these elevated terraces. So if you collect these shells on all these terraces, you would expect that the youngest shells are down here and the oldest shells are up here where the ice sheet was leaving the earliest. And we collected a, a bunch of shells, but we dated 
about 50 of them using radiocarbon, <coughs> calibrated them using the incal calibration curve and assumed a delta R of zero because those are really poorly constrained in narrow straight right now, so that's what we assume. So, so far, that's exactly what England and Beneke and the likes have done, but like as Melina has said in her talk, we get a problem because bivalves can only actually give us a limiting depth because we know that at the age of the deposition of this shell, there has been water above, but we don't know how much water was above the shell. But we, instead of modeling this, we have been reconstructing the habitat correction using uh, Delta O18. So we took water column measurements from the ship in Narrow Strait as we were out there, converted those to the expected O18 of the aragonite, and established a relationship between the water depth and the O18 of the shell. And then we applied that correction to the data set that we collected in the shells. And now we can not just say that the sea level was higher than the clam location, but we actually can get an estimate of how much. And that reduces the uncertainties from like 60 meters, what is the, can be the habitat of these shells, to up to 10. And I would like to see how that actually measures up to the models maybe at some point. Okay, so how does my data set actually inform us about the ice mass? Well, you cannot just reconstruct sea level, you can also model it. And a sea level model has uh, two submodels, so to speak. It has an earth model that gives us the viscosity structure of the earth, and you have an ice model. And I think my ice model movie might actually play here, which is super exciting. <laughs> but um, if we assume that the earth model that is employed in the sea level model is actually correct, we can see that any discrepancy between the sea level model and the data set that I'm presenting has to do with the ice model. So we can kind of constrain the timings where our ice model might not show the correct response. And this is exactly what I did. Oh. So first I want to show you what the, the model data is saying. I just um, used four, that, four data sets that I've been kindly been giving to, to show. And they all show very similar responses. So this is the graph that we're going to look at the, for the rest of the talk. So we have time on the x-axis, older time here, so 50,000 relative sea level on the y-axis, 200 meters to zero. And remember, the higher the sea level, the more the ice. That's kind of my assumption. And the reason these models show different sea level reconstructions is uh, because they use different temperature curves. So how does that fit with my data? In the Holocene, uh, the fit is really well. So my data falls exactly of where the curves predict that they should fall. And that gives me a little bit of a validation that my habitat correction might be going in the right direction and I'm actually able to better constrain sea level than has been done before. And this was what we expected and what my, my PhD project was about. And then we found shells that kind of gave us a little bit of a surprise. And um, not only did we find that our shells date back to 50,000 years ago, but we also find that they found at elevations much higher than what has been suggested so far. So we, in order to make this work, and we assume that the ice is the problem, the ice reconstructions, we need a lot more ice and an earlier onset of LGM <coughs> conditions in northwest Greenland. But at the same time, and this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because we are finding these near the modern coastline, we also need this area right at the modern coastline of Narrow Strait to be ice-free because we have marine conditions for these shells to grow there in the first place, right? So we need really high, high ice mass in this area, but we need uh, ice-free conditions at the same time in order to make that work. So we need a, a thicker ice sheet that maybe covers less area. What is also interesting is uh, if you don't just interpret the data that is there, but you also interpret the data that is not there, we <laughs> find that there's a, a gap in shells between 20,000 and 10,000 years. So what that could be because we weren't sampling correctly, but we think that that might actually be a, a valid signal and that might be the time where the northern Greenland ice sheet advanced to the modern coastline, so all of a sudden there was no more open water habitat for shells to grow. And uh, there are a couple of outliers which we think are reworked data, reworked shells, which is bad in one way, but it also gives me a little bit of hope in another way because all of these outliers are at lower elevations, which means that maybe gravity is a driving factor of redeposition. And these <coughs> high elevations, if they are deposited, redeposited, are redeposited somewhere here. And I'm not seeing that, so I'm hoping that that can give me confidence that these high elevation reconstructions are actually correct. Oh, oh. 
So I already touched on some of the outstanding issues. One is the deposition after, uh, the transport after deposition. And while I cannot quantify that at this time or give like a, a, a proof that my shell elevations are actually accurate, I'm hoping that if they weren't accurate, my spread of elevation data would be a lot higher than what I'm seeing right now. I'm also hoping to improve the dating accuracy by constraining the reservoir age in Nerys Strait a little bit better. That's something that I'm hoping to do in the upcoming few weeks, month, maybe next year, like soon, hopefully. <laughs> but that wouldn't actually change the main interpretation because that would likely shift the dates back and forth maybe 200 years, but it wouldn't change the bigger picture of the story that I'm trying to tell. I'm also hoping to improve my habitat correction because of course right now I'm using the modern water column profiles which might not have been the same in the past. And I do see evidence by just looking at um, the O18 that I'm looking in the shell, seeing in the shells that there might have been some freshwater influxes which you would expect during the deglacial. And I'm hoping that I can incorporate those into my data set to make it a little bit more robust. But just kind of testing the sensitivities just before like the last week, I, I find the reconstruction is relative robust to extensive influxes of uh, fresh water. And then again, um, I assume in this entire talk that all the mismatch between the data and the model is due to, chain, like due to the ice model. It can, of course, also be due to the earth model. And um, I haven't looked at all at lateral variations in the mantle viscosity, so I can't actually comment about that. And that might be an assumption that is in part also wrong. So these are the three main points that I'm hoping you remember. My reconstructions indicate that there may have been a lot more ice in MIS 2 and 3 up in northern Greenland than the models currently predict. But at the same time, there might be open ocean conditions at around the coastline of Nerys Strait. And um, the ice, the shell gap that I'm seeing in my data, I'm thinking that might be interpretable as a deglacial feature that precedes the, the Holocene ice loss in that region. So the advance of the ice that we're seeing might actually be the, the not the telltale, but the predecessor of the Holocene ice loss. And if you would like to learn more about the Peterman story, there are two excellent posters that are also from the same expedition. One is by Brendan Riley, that's on Friday. He's gonna talk about the Holocene activity of the Peterman glacial system because I've been focusing on the older part of the record and he has some interesting stuff on, on the Holocene. And Sean Markard, who's also gonna talk about Holocene glaciation of Northwest Greenland, and he has a poster also on Friday, I believe in the same poster session. Thank you very much. So you only take into consideration the shells that you collected? Yes. And you didn't want to take any already published data? I, that's data? what I want to do. I would like to use them. I just haven't yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that might cover the gap of the years that you had. I, what the literature shows is that they're in that region that has always been written about as an area with very little mm -hmm. evidence in terms of shells. Okay. There's a question way in the but back. Of course, I, that's, I definitely need to do that. Did you use Arctica, Islandica, and Patella? Was that right? Which species did you uh, use? I did not use Arctica, Islandica. I used oh. uh, Maya truncata and oh, okay. uh, Astarte borealis. Okay, thank you. You know, the reconstructions that Benoit has done and Bovinther of the elevation change at ice core sites show that Camp Century up in northwest Greenland has one of the greatest elevation changes uh, since the early Holocene. Um, and it has been argued that the reason for that was this coalescing and buttressing that stopped during the Holocene, but it, it would be very interesting to compare what they think about how much more ice was there at Camp Century with how much more ice you would need uh -huh. to get these sort of um, sea, really high sea levels that you have. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. So yeah, that's just sort of a, have you looked at no, no, I haven't, but okay. I, I'm just as excited. Cool. So I'll keep you on the loop. <laughs> I'm, I feel I'm, I'm an outlier, you know, not only in terms of age, but also <laughs> in terms of um, presenting an area that is far away from ice sheets. And my, where, how can I move? Uh -huh. Oh, this, yeah. Right, the, my, my talk is motivated um, by this uh, sea level curves, so time is here, so this is sea level. And so we are looking at the last interglacial period, uh, so MIS-5E, and there are a couple of, uh, of um, 
not only um, um, literature but also sites indicating that within 5E there is a jump in sea level, uh, one is here and the other one is here, indicating that the sea level wasn't stable during the last interglacial. So this is this, these are the two sites and for simplicity no error bars. Uh, this is the, uh, the sea level curve for the last interglacial um, uh, presented um, on the basis of screened um, uh, thorium uh, and uranium data um, and the purple um, uh, dots indicate the data and the, uh, the red uh, curve is the Monte Carlo 95% confidence interval. There is a, a, a dip here, but it's difficult to see. So how to investigate that? I'm, I'm doing this by looking at two different sites. One is uh, what is what is called a fascia site. So we move far away from ice um, and high latitude into low latitudes. Um, and this is a mixed carbonate siliciclastic deposit outside the tropics. And the, the, uh, my second example is a carbonate one from the reef. So this is my first example. Uh, it is called Hercla. It, it is part of this uh, multiple location uh, uh, compilation of, of sites and it, it's supposed to show uh, this drop uh, at about 124,000 years ago. We, we investigated that um, and indeed uh, looking at the fascias very carefully, uh, we, we do find a, a succession of uh, shore phase uh, uh, followed by um, a foreshore deposit, followed by a dune, and an another, indeed, a second foreshore uh, overlying the, the dune, and then a dune again. So this is the, um, this is the uh, succession. We then looked at the whole entire um, area, so carefully uh, investigating the whole uh, cliff, and coming up with this type of, uh, of uh, results, and these are based uh, partly on, uh, on lithology and uh, on optical dating. And we, in, in the optical dating, not only to date the deposits uh, themselves, but also to constrain using a uh, Bayesian uh, statistical approach the, uh, the timing of the bounding uh, surfaces. So the results are, yes, uh, there, there is a, uh, a, a there is a 120 thousand year sea level um, at the bottom, uh, followed by a lagoon, uh, and then an erosional surface, or at least a subaerial one, and um, a second foreshore. The second foreshore, however, turns out to be, in, in terms of age, uh, MIS 5A, not 5E. So uh, there's, there's the first uh, the problem. The sea level does indeed uh, do what we uh, what was described, so th it is a, a falling sea level followed by a, um, a rising sea level. The other uh, important feature that I'd like to point out is that uh, here is the, uh, the subaerial surface and this blue line is indicating what we interpret at, as the um, transgression surface. And in areas across the, uh, this coastal uh, section, it uh, coalesces, so they are falling uh, together, that's an important feature. So we note that the second foreshore is actually not 5E, but 5A. And secondly, I'd like to point out that the transgression surface is using a pre-existing uh, subaerial surface, um, and therefore there is a difficulty in terms of uh, surface interpretation. Second example, carbonate, and this is from the literature. This is uh, Blanchon et al. 2009, uh, indicating a, a jump of a uh, small jump in sea level from three meters up to uh, to six meters, um, uh, backed up and, and shown by, by a breakwater fascias uh, covered by a regressive uh, beach fascias. So what we did in this case, we used CalvoCut model uh, to try and um, simulate or uh, reconstruct uh, this, this um, sort of feature. And CalvoCut is a, is a, is a state-of-the-art uh, carbonate model that uses, uh, we operate it on stratigraphically significant um, a spatial scale, so it's about 50 kilometers, in, uh, and we, we use a, a carbonate margin um, a reef crest um, as a topography. Uh, we adopt accumulation rates um, of, uh, from the uh, last uh, Pleistocene um, Bahamian um, data, so 15 uh, millimeters per year for the crest and five for the back shore. Um, for the for the back reef and subsidence um, rates uh, adopted from what we modeled in terms of uh, four bulge um, 
uh, collapse in this area and constant environmental condition. So what turns out here, and, and the, um, this, the, the eustatic sea level from, from the uranium uh, data. Okay, our model gives us two timelines. They are indicated here in black. Uh, and these are the model times um, indicated here. And these, these two lines, uh, chronostratigraphic, sono chronostratigraphically significant lines, um, coincide with uh, 5A and 5E. So in other words, uh, the model does show us ravinement surfaces, which we do not find um, a subaerial surface um, uh, in this model. Uh, we note, however, and like to point that out very clearly, there is a migration of the carbonate uh, uh, platform margin. We do see that, but this, m this migration is not producing a surface that would be stratigraphically relevant and uh, therefore uh, able or help us in interpreting um, a sea level change. So we note that the, um, uh, the chronostratigraphic lines are ravinement surfaces and the classical concept that underpins this model is actually not conducive to understand um, small sea level changes. In addition, uh, I, I'd like to present a, a, um, a GIA a response curve. Now, in this case, to be very clear, this is not face value. This is uh, using um, um, I6G for the, for the last interglacial to Holocene, so we are in a different time frame. And for obvious reasons, I have not used the, the last interglacial um, in order to come up with a, a significant number. So there's time again versus the sea level. And uh, we model Helglas, the, uh, the uh, non-tropical site versus Bahamas, and this is the, uh, the, the um, eustatic sea level curve um, implemented in this model. Uh, uh, first of all, um, yes, so the time is different, and secondly, the, this is a uniform Earth model um, across the area, which is, uh, again, probably not, um, uh, not uh, appropriate um, in terms of quantifying the, the difference between the two sites but it does help us a little bit in terms of understanding that there, there is, these two sites do respond very differently um, to uh, sea level rise and, um, and constant sea level after the end of the melting because the, the high glass site seems to show a continental levering whereas the, uh, the tropical site is, is showing a sort of a monotonous uh, sea level rise. Okay, so. Um, in, we also note that um, the GIA effect can be ver very big, probably as big as a, as a jump can be. Okay, so what do people do when they try to ad identify small sea level jumps uh, within the last interglacial? And this is an example from literature. Most people do actually use uh, um, erosional surfaces, but the model showed uh, that this can be quite uh, difficult <laughs> because, again, um, this marginal, uh, the platform margin migration uh, doesn't produce um, timelines in our model. Okay, so the, here are my conclusions and they are a little bit more general and a, bit, a little bit uh, beyond uh, the case um, studies that I'm showing here. Um, in terms of fascias, I would say the architecture is, is in, incomplete. Uh, we've seen that in many sites. The time resolu resolution isn't, isn't very good. Um, we cannot use uranium series dating for most of these or for all of these sites. Um, we note uh, from literature and from my own experience, they, um, the, these sites tend to, um, to record the falling part of the sea level curve um, rather than the, the full um, um, sea level curve. And um, the stratigraphic discontinuity <coughs> um, for small uh, um, scale types is, 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 I would say, it's not preserved. The carbonate, um, sites, um, the, we, we think the architecture isn't good enough for this time uh, um, frame we are looking at. Uh, the, ex the, the time resolution is excellent um, and that um, is intriguing and the uh, stratigraphic discontinuity uh, is um, not on a regional scale. So my, my overall uh, conclusion is, is, is I'd like to uh, highlight uh, issues. I haven't got an answer to, to, the, to the problem, but I'd like to highlight key issues. One is the, the, the quality of the carbonate uh, proxy record, um, excellent in, in terms of resolution, but what are the boundary conditions and the internal thresholds? Um, I feel most people do not look at that. The preservation of the bounding surfaces and downstepping architecture tend to be not um, preserved. And sec secondly, the sensitivity of the carbonate um, proxy is, 
is very dependent on wave impact uh, versus um, production rate. And we noticed in our model that they are sort of um, competing with each other and, may, and that could be the reason why the, uh, the erosional or the, the, the subaerial surface is not uh, preserved. And um, um, ultimately the GIA effects uh, impact on the sensitivity of the record. Oh no, this is, um, okay, no, I, the, I, I've, I'm, this is the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Just in terms of the carbonates, um, what do you think a, I mean, I wish Andrea Dutton was here, so I wouldn't be the only one up here as well, but uh, <laughs> um, she's noted that you see in many different places, it, so getting away from the GIA effect, at least in, in terms of you do see those erosional surfaces at multiple, you know, far field sites, and so what would, what would be your thinking on why it's, it seems to be very common to find you know, an erosional surface with a capped again by another coral. Yes, um, I know, but they tend to be not on a regional and stratigraphically uh, significant scale. That's first of all. Okay. Even if they, if, if they are at the same level, we don't know what the internal threshold is and what, what these surfaces actually mean. Do the, does the reef in this moment respond to a change of accommodation space that isn't necessarily sea level? Okay because the regional scale is missing, that's the problem. Okay, I guess one other question is, so why do you, would you expect to then, thinking of Holocene corals as a test bed, would you see those kind of like, but they're all below sea level obviously, yeah. but um, would you expect to see some kind of a surface like that as well in those? Or? You, you, you would think, uh, you would think the, uh, the younger dryas could be a sort of a analog for, for that. But the problem is that with these type of proxies, once they have um, experienced a full Milankovitch cycle, their, their entire um, uh, properties and characteristics change so significantly that it's not um, helpful uh, to use a Holocene um, record as, a, okay. as an analog. Oh, cool. At the beginning of your talk, you showed a sea level drop at 125,000 years ago. What is the chronology based on? to say that it was around this time. This is uh, uranium series. It is uranium series, okay. Uh, my name is Javier Blasco, and I'm currently developing my PhD thesis at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. And well, the original title of this uh, session was Antarctic Ice Sheet Sensitivity to Oceanic Temperatures. So in our uh, group, we are developing a new ice sheet model. And as results were coming out, we saw that more to oceanic temperatures, there was a nicer story to tell, uh, something new to tell related to the sensitivity study of the Antarctic ice sheet to, uh, towards ice dynamics. So um, the original motivation was taking a look at the sea level differences during the last four glacier cycles. We see that there has been a lot of variability and we know that uh, May the main source for this variability comes from paleo ice sheets. Particularly, we were taking a look at the Antarctic ice sheet and for the last glacial maximum, and we saw two things, that neither the ice estimates are estimated as really constrained between 5 and 18 meters, nor really the, the timing of this maximum are constrained. So we were asking ourselves, well, maybe something we can be done here related to ice dynamics. So uh, if we take a look at the present day ice, Antarctic ice sheet, it is generally divided into two parts. The West Antarctic ice sheet, which is a marine based ice sheet, and the East Antarctic ice sheet, a land based uh, ice sheet. Now, uh, there are two important evolving processes uh, for our ice sheet, which is on one side the oceanic forcing, but on the other uh, hand, we have also the ice dynamics. Now, uh, classically, for the evolution of the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, it has been played with the oceanic forcing because it is thought that the West Antarctic ice sheet is the main reason for the sea level, differ sea level differences. However, recent studies, studies from Stokes and co-workers suggested that for land-based ice streams, dynamics could be more active than expected. So we tr decided to uh, analyze the dynamics, especially regarding for the East Antarctic ice sheet because it's in the, it's, uh, it is in its vast majority a land-based ice sheet. 
So what have you used for studying this? We have used this model, a new model, uh, Yelmo, and it is based on the Grizzly model. And it divides, a, it's a shallow ice, shallow shelf uh, model, where the grounded ice is non-sliding, non and it's solved using the shallow ice approximation. Uh, the ice streams, uh, the ice shelves, uh, the floating ice, are solved using the shallow shelf, uh, shallow shelf approximation with no buses sliding. And here comes the important part that we have played with, with the ice streams, uh, we treat them as uh, an addition of shallow shelf approximation and shallow ice approximation. Now, uh, a grid point is activated as, as ice stream if water is created at the base and the pressure at, that at, the, at the water exceeds a threshold we impose, and it's called H min. Uh, and the basal dragging applied to the SSA solution is a linear viscous basal drag dependent on the effective pressure on the basal sliding and on a friction coefficient. So basically, we are here. Here going we are going to play here with two important parameters, which are H min, which determines the population of ice streams in our uh, domain, and the friction coefficient, which um, uh, which will accelerate or slow down our ice stream dynamics. Also, we have used a different basal melting uh, parameterization as the conventional, uh, which is normally based on Beckman goose which is based on observations. We take the observations from uh, Rignot data, uh, from Rignot, and uh, we transform the te oceanic temperature anomalies into basal melting rates with a parameter we call kappa. Here in this experiment, we have set a large kappa because we wished our ice sheet to extend up to the continental shelf, as uh, data suggests, and <coughs> when one periods appro uh, come, it can retreat. So these are our results. And this is what we see on the upper panel. We can see uh, uh, our grounded ice volume, how it has evolved during the last four glacial cycles. And on the lower panel, we can see the grounded area. Uh, as we see in the upper panel, uh, as uh, cold periods approach, we have larger volumes, and as warm periods approach, uh, volume decreases. However, we see that there's a clear distinction. The red colors are related to a, a high stream activity case whereas the blue colors are related to a low stream activity case. And we see that there's a clear clusterization, uh, mainly dictated but by this uh, water, uh, water threshold we have imposed. Mm -hmm. However, if we take a look at the grounded area, we don't see this clusterization, which is because uh, we know that our ice sheet has generally reached the continental shelf. Now, in the scatter plot I want to show, you can see here in the x-axis the stream points, the um, percentage <coughs> compared to the comp uh, total ice sheet, and on the y-axis the LGM volume that has, has been computed. And as we see, lower activity, uh, lower stream activity have lower stream points and therefore have larger ice volumes. In fact, if we take a look at the high activity and at the uh, stream po uh, high activity and the low activity, we can see that it is uh, twice as large, the volume. Now, uh, just taking a look at three snapshots for a low stream activity case, a medium stream activity case, a high stream activity case. Here on the upper panel, we can see the surface elevation. We see in the case of a low stream activity case that our ice sheet is much larger. And, uh, and on the high stream activity case, our, <coughs> ice, uh, our surface is much lower. And if we take a look at the surface, at the velocity profile, we can see that in the uh, high stream activity case, ice streams were able to penetrate more into our ice sheet and therefore our surface elevation was lower. However, what surprised us is when we took a look at the sea level estimates uh, compared to the present day, uh, modeled present day ice sheet. And now what we can see was on one side that larger ice discharge happened for lower ice dynamics, things we couldn't understand, and the, although there's a, a linearity, linearity it is not as much clear and as in the case of the LGM volume. Now we can see that a uh, lower stream points activity contributes to a larger sea level equivalence for the LGM. However, it's not that clear that uh, it's not so differentiated. And we asked ourselves how this happened, well, how this was possible. Well, so what you can see here is the difference uh, between the um, LGM uh, velocity profile uh, the, and the present day uh, velocity profile. And as we see in the lower case, which is for the low stream activity case, ice streams, uh, as it uh, reached the present day ice sheet, 
the, the ice streams did not penetrate inside our uh, the Antarctic ice sheet. Whereas in the high stream activity case, ice streams were penetrating. Uh, you can see it here, for example, here, ice streams have penetrated more. And how is this translated? Well, if we take a look at the anomalies of the ice thickness, uh, yeah, here we can see the anomalies of the ice thickness, again, <coughs> of the LGM and the model present day. What you see in red colors is that it has lost mass, uh, where it has lost mass during the um, uh, acid, uh, the present day uh, was reached. And in blue colors you can see where it was gaining mass. So you see that there are much more red colors here in the, run, uh, in the low stream activity case than the high stream activity case, which are indicating us that here there has been a lot of mass loss. And particularly, if we make now the difference between the high stream activity case and the low stream activity case, seen here, uh, what you can see here in blue colors is that where the uh, zones where the low stream activity case has discharged more mass as the, uh, than the high stream activity case as the present day. So we see that the blue colors are generally associated to marine based zones. So because the ice stream dynamics were too low, oceanic forcing could uh, delete those, uh, could uh, collapse those parts. Whereas these red colors here are related to a larger high stream activity, which is indicating us that in the center of our uh, Antarctic ice sheet, uh, as the uh, more ice was lost because of the ice stream dynamics that was partially compensating this effect of the, uh, of the oceanic forcing. So basically the conclusions I want you to take home is that a more dynamic uh, ice sheet implies a lower AGL volume and that, uh, but for a more dynamic ice sheet, larger penetrations of ice streams can uh, go inside our ice sheet, and this can partially compensate the ice retreat due to oceanic forcing. However, in general, the role of ice streams if, is necessary for the study of the Antarctic ice sheet, and it has been not really studied. And in fact, the ice sheet maximum size and the timing is determined by the ice stream dynamics. As we can see here, just two experiments, this is a low stream activity case. Uh, it is not only that the volume is larger because we have low, lower ice streams, but also the maximum that has happened in different periods. And mm. this is really important because this could be indicated that we have different, that this is a different climatic process that should be taken into account. And well, that was all. Thank you. If you account for all that you said and uh, <coughs> see the range of your kappa value and the range that it produces in terms of sea level changes. Can you plot a curve that gives you the sensitivity to kappa to the uh, sea level coming from the Antarctica? Uh, well, we made different also studies for kappas, for this sensitivity to ocean forcing. And well, these were basically our results. There are a lot, <laughs> uh, and nothing can be read here. But, um, however, we took a large sensitivity to the ocean because we wished our ice, uh, ice sheet to extend to the maximum size, but the theoretical hypothesized value obtained also from Brignot, which should, uh, says that kappa should be around 10 meters by, uh, by year by Kelvin, uh, is not really far out, uh, shows similar results to what we have obtained for our kappa. How you generate the forcings, temperature and pressure? Ah, forcings, the forcings, where yes. they come from? Yes. Yeah, we used an, uh, an anomaly method, like mm -hmm. in the ocean lake temperatures. We took an L LGM snapshot and, well, an LGM map for ocean, uh, atmosphere and ocean and uh, precipitation, and we're uh, evolving with only orbital forcing uh, for four cycles. One of the things we see today is many of the regions where Basal melt at the ice streams is very vigorous. We observe that some of these ice streams are accelerating, and I would imagine that if you have a beginning marine ice sheet instability due to high basal melt, you may also see some acceleration of the ice streams. Is that sort of process also being modeled? And so you're showing that it's just simply not enough that the ice discharge increases to overcome the ocean melting? Well, uh, that's something we also want to take a look at, if how do you 
uh, the effect of increasing temperatures affects the ice tube dynamics. But um, I mean, right now it's something uh, I think this would be with a subgrid treatment we want to implement into our model. This could be really observed, but I don't. Uh, right now I would I don't know if it's if this is something that has been observed here in our experiments.